Uh, as Lauren just mentioned, I'm uh, on the technical marketing team uh, assigned to Vault. And, uh, you know, on uh, November 11th, we released Vault 1.6. Um, and I'm super excited to show you what uh, we've been up to. You know, we have a, a bunch of, um, you know, feature enhancements, uh, a bunch of new functionality, and obviously a whole slew of bug fixes. So um, there's lots to check out. Um, for the, here's sort of a brief agenda of what I wanted to cover. Um, you know, we're, we're going to chat about, you know, Vault 101, just to sort of um, uh, set the stage for uh, what we're going to, um, you know, chat about in the later part of the talk here. Um, and then I wanted to sort of focus on some core functionality that we've uh, uh, deployed in Vault 1.6 that's in, uh, most of it's in technical preview, uh, some of it's uh, in uh, production here. So there's been some integrated storage enhancements, um, some stuff with the Transform secret engine, a new key management uh, secret engine, and then obviously uh, many other features, and we'll just sort of briefly chat about that. Before I, I dive in too much, um, I just want to mention that uh, if you haven't seen it before, there's a site called learn.hashicorp.com, which um, basically has all, all the content that we're going to talk about today up there for free. It's not, you don't have to log in or anything like that. Um, uh, and it's basically hands-on labs and it's sort of like a gold mine of content. If you're interested in, uh, you know, getting hands-on with any of this stuff, you can go over there. And uh, just walk through it step by step and uh, deploy this functionality. Um, again, that's learn.hashicorp.com if you haven't seen it. Cool. So let's uh, dive over into uh, Vault 101. I'll just chat about that maybe for a couple minutes, and then uh, we'll uh, dive into these features. For most of this stuff, I rather, um, you know, we'll talk about the feature at a high level, and then I'll just show you a demo because I think you rather probably see it in action versus uh, me chatting about it. Um, also, as Laura mentioned, um, you know, if you have any questions, uh, make sure just uh, pop them in the QA box and uh, we'll work through them. All right, let's get started. So what is Vault? Um, maybe I'll take a step back and just sort of explain the problem that uh, uh, Vault addresses. So, um, you know, I, I spent, uh, you know, over 15 years as a Linux sysadmin, uh, working for, you know, startups all the way up to, um, like, megacorps. And... Uh, you know, whenever you're dealing with uh, infrastructure or applications, there's always secret data that you need to, uh, you know, interact with. Secret data doesn't mean like top secret data, well, although it can, but it, typically we're talking about um, things like usernames, passwords, uh, API keys, um, you know, uh, TLS certificates, uh, anything you use to that you d don't necessarily want to be uh, public, right? Um, and what typically happens is uh, you're going to have this sprawl of infrastructure and you're going to have secrets all over the place. You're, they're going to be embedded in uh, web apps. They're going to be sitting on the file system. They're, they're potentially even in source code. Uh, you know, they're sitting in config files. And it becomes this massive uh, nightmare, especially when you get to, um, you know, the startup phase where all of a sudden you're starting to interact with, um, you know, user PII data, uh, you know, stuff that, you know, if someone comes along, a hacker breaks in and they dump your database, obviously that's going to be uh, super bad, right? If you're not uh, protecting that data. Um, so what Vault is, is it's a, a solution that centrally manages all your secrets and it sits on a network. And so you can interact with uh, Vault via API, CLI, or a web interface. And it's basically a, a centralized store that's, you know, audited and logged. And you can attach policies and all sorts of security around, you know, how you secure this uh um, you know, the secret data. And the workflow is, um, you know, a user will be provisioned access uh, or a machine. It's uh, a lot of the time a machine will say, hey, I need this database credential. It'll ask Vault. Vault will check to make sure it says it who, it, it, you know, verify its identity and then pass back the secret data. So that's sort of the, you know, the high level Vault 101. And that's why the majority of uh, uh, people are using it, sort of to wrangle that secret sprawl. Um, I think that's probably enough, uh, you know, Vault 101. Uh, obviously, if you have any questions, uh, just pop them in the chat and we'll, we'll address them. So the first uh, features that I wanted to chat about are something called Cloud Auto Join and automated snapshots for the integrated storage uh, feature. So integrated storage, um, if you haven't heard of it before, is, uh, so I, I mentioned, you know, Vault sits, sits as a centrally managed uh, secret store. And obviously, Vault needs to store those secrets that you're putting in it somewhere, right? Um, 
for a long time it uh, was console, but um, um, we wanted to sort of ease the management overhead, uh, especially for people who are you know uh, wanting to play around with Vault and uh, for smaller installs. And although obviously you can use uh, integrated storage for larger installs too, but um, so integrated storage is a feature where you can create a highly available cluster just with Vault, and it has a, a storage backend uh, integrated right into Vault, and that's called integrated storage. So you don't need to have like um, you know some external storage uh, system or something like that uh, that manages uh, Vault. Obviously, it's all in, all encrypted and all that stuff. So um, the cloud auto join feature, um, you know, when you're setting up uh, an integrated storage cluster. You know, typically it'll be, you know, three plus nodes. And um, when we first rolled it out, you had to hard code the IP addresses of each cluster node. And um, we were getting feedback and seeing, uh, you know, a lot of feature requests to say, hey, you know what, I'm using uh, Vault in a, um, uh, you know, a load balancer group. And, you know, I, as load comes in, I want to spin up or spin down these instances. And the... There's obviously a problem with that if you're hard coding this stuff, right? We don't know the IP addresses of uh, you know each cluster address, and so we need a way to look that up. And so that's what this uh, cloud auto join uh, feature is. I'll demonstrate it in a second here. The second feature here is um, automated snapshots. So okay, uh, we're running Vault. We have integrated storage set up. Uh, how do I do my backups and restores? You know, if uh, the Vault gets blown away or something like that, or you know, uh, uh, someone wipes out all my VM instances, how do I recover from that? Um, snapshots is basically the answer in that um, you'll run the snapshot command, you'll dump the database, um, and then, uh, you know, if you need to restore it, you can, uh, you know, restore it from that snapshot. However, um, we, we wanted to add, add the capability to schedule snapshots. So say, for example, hey, um, you know, every 12 hours, I want to take a snapshot and I want to retain, um, you know, 20 snapshots, uh, you know, and I want to save it into this directory on the file system. Uh, this feature allows you to do that. It allows you to basically schedule um, snapshot snapshots. Um, it also has the functionality to, you know, save it locally or it can upload it into an S3 bucket. So. This is an enterprise feature. Um, however, uh, you know, just uh, running the snapshot command is, you know, open source. Uh, so um, you could, you know, totally just wrap that in a cron job or something like that and probably get the same functionality. So I don't think that's a big showstopper if you wanted to automate snapshots on your own. Um, I think at this point, what I'm going to do is I'll jump over to uh, the demo environment and uh, I'll show you what that looks like. We'll demonstrate these two features. So just bear with me for a sec while I get this set up. All right, so you should see my um, uh, GCP console, so Google Cloud. Um, obviously, you could use any uh, cloud provider for this. I just use uh, you know Google Cloud as an example. So I have a three-node vault cluster here. <laughs> Um, right now, uh, sorry, I just got a cough here for a sec. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so right here, I have a, a three node vault cluster. Um, uh, and these are, it's already set up just to, you know, ease the demo. So, uh, vault one is the leader node, and then I have two followers. I'll, I'll show you what that looks like in a second, but say I wanted to add this, uh, fourth vault node into the cluster. Um, typically what you do, you'd need to know these IP addresses, but, uh, we're, I'm going to show you how to do that using the new, uh, cloud auto join feature where you don't have to input the IP address. Uh, technically how it works is we use something called go discover. Um, and it supports, uh, you know, pretty much all cloud providers, anything where you can sort of get meta metadata from the platform that you're running on. And how it works is I tag the instances that I want it, um, you know, this fourth node to auto join into. So right now I, I've tagged these instances with something called vault AJ demo, which is, you know, vault auto join demo. And on the fourth node, when I'm running the command, what I'm going to say is, Hey, uh, I'm going to provide a config file and I'm going to say, um, you know, I want you to use, uh, um, 
you know, Google Cloud's uh, metadata service. I want you to go in in this particular region, and I want you to look up all instances that have this particular tag, and then I want to try those instances to join it. So, you know, this will work if you're running on, uh, you know, AWS. You'll use the same, uh, you know, you'll just ta tag or label the instance. Same thing with Azure. You know, we we the Go Discover uh, plugin supports a ton of different uh, cloud providers. You know, all the big ones and a, a bunch of smaller ones too. So. I think that explains uh, this enough. Uh, let's jump over to the console, and I'll, I'll show you what this actually looks like. All right, great. So um, I'm connected to the fourth node in Google Cloud right here. Um, I'll just show you the config file. So I have, I've downloaded Vault 1.6. I have uh, the config file. I'll just briefly walk you through what it's uh, doing here. So you have the normal stuff that you'd, uh, you know, sort of the normal uh, instantiation bits that you'd run through when you're uh, deploying, uh, you know, an integrated storage cluster. You're going to have this uh, uh, raft um, uh, storage backend configured. You're going to have the node ID where you want the, the data actually live. The new piece here is this uh, retry join, and then we're using this auto join um, feature here. So I'm saying, hey, the provider is GCE, Google Compute. Um, and then I'm saying, hey, I want to uh, look for any instances in US West 1B, and I want to find any instances that have this tag. And that relates back to you know what I show you do on the uh, web interface there, where, hey, so it's going to go run a query against Google Cloud saying, hey, give me all those instances. Um, and then Vault's going to go ahead and try to connect to them. Uh, so this should be a, a really simple way to sort of bootstrap your environment. If you, you know, you're running an auto scaling group or something like that, and you uh, want to provision new nodes, they can self-discover now, which is uh, awesome. All right. So what I'm going to do is we'll fire this um, uh, node up. Um, I'm also running a split screen here. So in the top, I'm going to run the vault server. And then in the bottom piece here, I'll run my commands, you know, just to verify that it's actually working as we expect. Um, so let me, I'm going to run vault server. I'm going to provide the config file. But what you can see here, let me just uh, scroll up into the output. So um, you can see here we did a raft, uh, a raft to look up. Um, you know, we did a we, uh, you know, fired up the Go Discover uh, plugin behind the scenes. It's using GCE. We're we're using the uh, project name. It's looking up any instances in US West One B, and we get back this array of uh, addresses that match our query. So this is how um, you know it'll uh, bootstrap itself. It's giving an error right now because we haven't unsealed the vault. So just because we know the addresses doesn't mean we can. Um, you know, go ahead and uh, add a node to the cluster. So we need to, um, you know, unseal the vault. So what I'll do here in the bottom window, I'm connected to the same uh, node. I'm going to run vault operator unseal and give it the unseal key. Now, um, up in the top window here, let me just uh, enter. So you sh we should see it uh, unseal and join. Yeah, great. So it says uh, entering a follower state. Um, perfect. So then in the bottom window, if we run a vault status, let's try to resize this a little bit. So you can see now we're part of the cluster. Um, you know, if I list the vault or uh, raft peers, you can see now we have, um, you know, our existing three node cluster. And then our fourth node is now part of the uh, cluster. Um, just to sort of verify that, hey, this is actually working. Um, you know, I, I set up, uh, I added an example API key um, to the uh, existing cluster. I just want to verify that, uh, you know, the fourth node that joined can actually pull down some data. So you can see I have a, you know, a web app key, and then I uh, threw in a particular value. You know, this is typically what you might do. Say, for example, um, you know, you have a web app or something like that, and uh, you know, maybe you're processing payments or you're 
um, you know, sending emails, uh, you know, connecting to a database or any of uh, that type of stuff. You can use just static secrets like this. You can, you know, uh, use the key value store, um, you know, give your little name of what you want to call this secret. I'm calling it API key. And then you can provide, uh, this might be a username and password or something like that. Um, great. So that's sort of the auto join demo. Um, uh, let me just show you the config file again. So it's, uh, it's, you know, pretty basic in that uh, this uh, Go Discover plugin is already something that uh, we used uh, internally. Um, so it's, uh, you know, well-baked and it's, uh, uh, you can use it in integrated storage today. The one thing I will say is that, you know, if you want to play around with this, um, again, that learn.hashicorp.com site, if you go over to the vault section, there's something called what's new in 1.6. And there's a guide that talks, uh, walks you through this step-by-step. Uh, -step. I think the guide talks about AWS. So I just wanted to show you that it also worked on GCP. All right, cool. So um, that sort of covers the integrated storage piece. What I wanted to show you was the uh, snapshot uh, functionality now. So um, for a, a normal snapshot, you'd run something like this, you know, vault operator raft, uh, raft is the integrated storage uh, protocol. You're going to say, Hey, I want to save a snapshot. And then, you know, this is what I'm going to call the snapshot. So I, you know, obviously I don't have a bunch of data, um, you know, in this vault right now because it's just a demo. So that ran super quick. Um, you know, if I, uh, just list the directory, you can see uh, the demo snapshot. But um, around the sort of automated snapshots, uh, here's what that would look like if you uh, were to run that. So I'll just walk you through this command. Um, you know, if you're going to do this in practice, I'd, I'd recommend, you know, obviously checking out the docs and run through the learn guide and sort of play around with this to get familiar with, uh, uh, you know, how it's going to work. So I'm going to say, hey, you know, I want to write a new uh, config into the storage, uh, you know, auto snapshot feature. Um, I want to I set up a, you know, a daily job. It's going to run every 24 hours. I want to save, you know, five backups. You know, it'll, it'll um, uh, you know, on five consecutive days or something like that. Um, here's the path that I want to, it to uh, save it to. You know, I'm just going to save this to my local disk. And, you know, I don't want the max storage to exceed, uh, you know, a gigabyte. What's cool about this is you can modify this command to say, um, um, you know, storage type S3, and then you provide your AWS uh, credentials and it can uh, get uploaded to a AWS S3 bucket. So, you know, now, you know, your vault cluster is being remotely backed up and you don't have to write any, uh, you know, shell scripts and be monitoring it, uh, you know, and all that stuff. So pretty cool feature. This is a, um, you know, enterprise, but, you know, you could, you know, uh, build a, sh a shell script or something like that to, you know, emulate this functionality uh, fairly quickly, I imagine. Cool. Um, I think that's it for those two features. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump back to the presentation and then we'll chat about the, the um, sort of next feature, the Transform Secret Engine, and then uh, uh, we'll go through a demo of that. Uh, great. So, Great. So this is the uh, Transform uh, Secret Engine. It's been in Vault for um, you know a few releases now, um, but it was only available at the command line. So you know we didn't have a, a web interface where you could go in and uh, play around with it. Um, so you know if you wanted to interact with it, uh, obviously you know when you're uh, learning a new feature like this, you know you're going to interact with the CLI, you're going to get comfortable with it, and then you're eventually going to you know integrate it into uh, you know, using the API, and you're going to have automated access. But um, sort of to speed up that process, we wanted to add the transform UI right into the, you know, web interface. I should mention this is an enterprise feature, part of the advanced data protection module. So um, probably the best way to just uh, describe this is just to show you. So what I'm going to do is um, I'll share my screen again, and then uh, I'll walk you through a demo of what this looks like. I'll also sort of walk you through, um, you know, a use case of why you might want to use something like this. Um, it's just taking a second to share my desktop. Perfect. So um, say, for example, um, the Transform Secret Engine, 
is, uh, you know, part of our advanced uh, data protection module, as I mentioned. But what's the problem it's trying to solve? So say, for example, um, maybe I'll just enable it while we're talking through this. Um, say, for example, you know, you're, uh, you know, an online retailer and, you know, you're processing uh, uh, payment transactions. Chances are, um, you know, maybe you're a big box store or something like that. Chances are you're going to be dealing with tons of PII data. You're going to have, uh, you know, um, you know, credit card numbers. You might have uh, loan applications, you know, that might involve, you know, social security numbers, addresses, names, birth dates, um, uh, all sorts of sort of PII data. That's probably going to bubble over into, you know, physical stores. It might be online. So you're going to amass, you know, this, this large repository of PII data. And how do you secure that? Um, you know, there's traditional methods of, um, you know, hey, I'm going to encrypt the backend storage. So if someone, you know, physically breaks into my uh, data center and they wheel out the server, you know, they can't get access to the data. Um, you know, obviously most, uh, uh, you know, everyone is using TLS to encrypt data. So, you know, it's encrypted, you know, in transit and at rest. But the reality is that, um, you know, when you're working with this data, um, most attacks don't happen by someone, you know, uh, breaching a, a, a hole in the data center and wheeling servers out. They obviously break in online, you know, and try to dump the databases. The problem uh, sort of with, uh, you know, encrypted at rest is that, you know, when a database is live, the data is unencrypted unless you've actually encrypted the data sitting physically in those tables. Um, so this is uh, the transform secret engine is, uh, you know, designed specifically to sort of target those use cases. And it's designed to encrypt the data that's actually sitting in those databases. So say, for example, you have credit card numbers. We're going to use something called FPE, format, perver format preserving encryption, which will, you know, uh, retain the same format of a credit card number um, so that you don't necessarily need to change the, you know, your table schemas and your databases and all that stuff uh, to support this. And it'll actually go through and you can encrypt that data sitting in those tables so that, you know, if someone does, um, you know, break in, they manage to dump your database, um, the data sitting in those tables is actually going to be encrypted. Uh, it was a super cool feature. Um, you know, it was uh, um, on the command line before and now it's uh, in the web interface. So let me go through and just uh, show you a demo what that actually looks like. So I'm going to call this, uh, you know, credit the card. I'm going to use format preserving encryption. Format preserving encryption, um, uh, typically what you'll see, you know, when you're using something like this, uh, we're calling it transformations, but, uh, you, you know, in traditional tokenization, it's going to have a lookup table of, you know, the tokenized value over to the real value. With FPE or format preserving encryption, we're actually uh, using encryption to, you know, secure this data so that, uh, you, you know, you can do a, a one-way transformation. Um, so I guess what I'm getting at is we're not actually maintaining, uh, you know, uh, a large table behind the scenes. However, we do have that feature. I'll show you that in a sec. But uh, so this feature just uses straight encryption, and so it doesn't require any storage. Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm uh, creating, creating a new transformation called credit card. I'm using format preserving encryption. I'm setting uh, where I want the key to be maintained. Um, uh, FPE works off of, um, you know, templates. So you can match data, say like, hey, I have a, a passport number, um, you know, so it's basically a regular expression that will find uh, passport numbers in any data or, hey, I'm, I'm setting a template here that will look for any credit card numbers. Um, you can define your own template. So if you have, uh, you know, a membership number that looks like some long string of digits or alphanumeric or whatever it is, uh, you can create your own template that will match that data. Now I'm going to create a role that'll support that. And I'm just going to call it payments. And then I'm going to create this transformation. Okay. So uh, through the UI, we actually have this new cool feature. Well, it's, it's been here for a long time, but uh, you, where you can use a command line right in it. Um, let me just clear this out of here. Cool. So um, uh, actually, let me just show you this again. So here's the transformation. It's all set up. Um, and then it gives you some CLI commands. This will obviously work at the traditional command line, but we also have a command line built right into the UI. So I'm going to copy this, uh, this one here, to actually encode the data. Uh, and then I'll just uh, enter a fake credit card number here. Uh, 
So let me walk you through what's happening. So we're saying vault, right? I want to encode some data using that uh, payments role. Um, here's the value that I want to encode. And then I want to use that transformation called credit card. So after I run this, what it's going to do is it's going to give me um, a value that looks like a credit card number. You know, it retains that same format, that FPE, Format Preserving Encryption. But this data is actually encrypted. Um, so what's cool about this is right now you might have this value, a real raw credit card sitting in a database somewhere. You can use this uh, Transform Secret Engine to actually encrypt that data. So now the number looks like this, but it's not actually the real credit card number. And then when you want to actually interact with that data, um, you know, you can uh, decode it. So I'm going to, uh, we'll run this uh, process in reverse. So the credit card number here again. So we're saying, hey, vault right, I want to decode this data. Um, you know, we're giving our encoded, uh, encrypted, um, you know, credit card number here. And then we get back the um, original credit card value. So this is super powerful if you actually want to project data, you know, PII data. You know, you're literally only a SQL ejection attack away from, you know, someone dumping your database and if uh, having access to the raw data if, uh, you know, you're not securing it properly. So um, that's that feature. Um, let me jump back to uh, the slides and then uh, we'll move on to the next one. Again, if you have any uh, questions about any of this stuff, um, you know, obviously use the uh, QA panel and we'll work through it. Great. So the next uh, feature that's this one's in technical preview. So, you know, we chatted about the transform secret engine. Um, you know, we chatted about FPE where, you know, you can use this format preserving encryption that's using um, you know, an encryption algorithm basically to, you know, encode and decode the data. It's not requiring any storage. We're not, you know, maintaining a table of any of the values that you've uh, encoded or decoded. Um, um, however, for certain customers, they do want um, non-reversible, you know, uh, traditional tokenization. You know, maybe you're in a highly regulated environment or maybe you're, a, uh, you know, a federal customer or something like that. And you have the requirement that, you know what, this has to be one way. It has to be a non-reversible, uh, you know, uh, function where if someone d dumps these, uh, you know, goes ahead and dumps the, that uh, database, uh, there's absolutely zero chance that they can get the original data. And that's where this sort of traditional idea of tokenization comes in. Uh, it's non-reversible. Um, you have uh, basically... Um, you know, added features here. Uh, the way it works is we are actually, uh, with this new tokenization feature, um, you know, we have the capability to connect out to a database where, you know, we'll store the token, we'll store net metadata, we'll store the encrypted value. Um, you know, this supports uh, searching, TTLs, all that kind of cool stuff. So um, now we support sort of FPE and also traditional uh, tokenization. Again, this is uh, a technical preview. So you know, don't roll this out into production or anything like that. We've rolled this out um, just to gather feedback. And, you know, obviously we're going to ref be refining it and adding uh, additional capabilities to it, but we wanted to get into the hands of uh, folks to sort of play around with. Um, I think we've chatted about this enough. So what I'm going to do is uh, we'll dive over to the command line again, and I'll just show you what this uh, actually looks like. So let me share my uh, screen again. Great. Um, actually, I need to... Um, so we already had the uh, Transform Secret Engine running, so I just need to... Uh, I'm just going to delete that old namespace where we had uh, FPE running. So in the top panel here, you know, I'm going to be interacting with Vault. In the bottom panel here, uh, I have Vault running, and you just have a tail of the uh, logs. I typically like to run this setup, you know, when I'm just sort of playing around with Vault so that I can, uh, you know, see what's happening as I'm typing commands. And then also, if, say, an error pops up or something, I can, uh, you know, see it right away. So um, we've cleaned up from the uh, to last demo. 
So what I'm going to do here is we're going to turn on the Transform Secret Engine again. Again, this is an enterprise feature, but uh, you can actually download the enterprise binary and play around with it. Um, you know, uh, uh, gives you a window, I, I think, of about 30 minutes to play around with it. But also, if you're actually interested in, uh, you know, playing around with this feature longer, there's a, a sign-up form. I think it's for a month where you can get a license. And, uh, you know, if you want to, you know, kick the tires on this uh, a little bit more, you can do it that way. So, um, you know, we looked at doing things through the UI. Now I'm going to do it over at the console. So um, I'm going to just paste these commands and I'll sort of chat about what I'm doing. So I'm uh, writing, I'm creating a new transform role called mobile payments. I'm, uh, you know, and again, I'm going to use that uh, credit card pattern uh, or template. Um, then I'm going to create a new transformation called tokenization. Uh, I'm going to use that credit card template. I'm going to use uh, that allowed role called mobile payments, and I'm going to set a, a timeout of uh, 24 hours. Timeout will just expire that data in 24 hours. Obviously, for you know um, certain type of data, you're not want to do that. Um, you know, if uh, you know you're a big box store or something, typically you're going to hang on to those, uh, you know, credit card numbers uh, as long as they're valid. So um, this just gives you the functionality to, um, you know, expire content if you wanted to. And then um, we're going to go and actually do a transformation. So I'll, I'll paste this command and then we'll just sort of chat about uh, what's happening here. So I'm going to write into the transform secret engine and I'm going to encode some data using that uh, mobile payments role. Here's the value that I'm going to encrypt, you know, another example password. I'm using the transformation credit card. I'm saying, hey, um, this credit card, you know, I want to I want to keep it around for eight hours and then I'm going to expire it. Cool thing here is you can also assign uh, metadata to it. So I'm just saying, hey, here's the uh, HashiCorp organization, the purpose is travel and, you know, it's an American Express card. Um, Cool feature about this is, you know, you can search this metadata, which is uh, amazing. So if you wanted to go and like look up, uh, you know, uh, credit cards, uh, you know, based on a certain tag or PII data based on a certain tag without actually exposing the, the real data, uh, you can do that. So um, now we get back this token. Uh, so the this card is now referenced by this token. This is a one-way HMAC. You can't reverse this token to any way get into uh, this to this uh, credit card. So you know if someone goes and uh, you know say you have this token stored in a you know a customer record that you know references this uh, credit card, uh, someone breaks in, they dump your entire database. Uh, there's no way they're going to reverse this because uh, it doesn't uh, represent the credit card in any way. Um, one thing that's sort of curious here is that we haven't actually defined a storage backend. Um, you know, so where is this actually living? So right now we're using the um, integrated storage feature. So Vault is actually maintaining its own, you know, internal storage of uh, these this uh, lookup table. However, obviously, if you have you know uh, millions or hundreds of millions of credit card numbers or PII data, you know, chances are you're going to want to use an external database. Um, you know, just so that you could scale it and get the performance requirements out of it. Um, so we give you two options there. One is you can use internal storage, um, and also you can use external storage. Again, this is uh, you know tech preview, so we're we're happy to get feedback uh, from anyone that's sort of interested in uh, using this uh, feature. Cool. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this token. I'm going to pop it into. Uh, I'm just going to create an environment variable. So let me. Uh, show you what I'm going to do here. So I'm going to uh, export this into an environment variable called mo my token. Just since, um, you know, I'm going to show you a bunch of commands here, how you can interact with this. And uh, I basically don't want to be pasting this token a bunch of times. So say I wanted to retrieve the uh, metadata for this token. Maybe I wanted to say, okay, I have this token. Um, you know, what, what sort of uh, metadata is associated with it? So I can, uh, you know, right into the transform secret engine. I'll say, hey, grab me the uh, metadata for this particular token, um, and then you'll get back these values. Um, you know, my, you might be looking at this and saying, hey, that's a, a map of data. Uh, I think realistically, when you're going to be interacting with this, it's going to be through an API or something like that. You know, a, a program is going to say, 
hey, I, I have this token, go look up the metadata. But, uh, you know, you can see we have our organization, HashiCorp, the purpose was travel, and the card type is uh, American Express. This is totally free form. You can put, uh, you know, your own your own stuff in there. Uh, you, don't, uh, you know, you can use any key values you want. Um, say we want to validate a token. So, uh, you know, in a customer record, we have that token sitting there and we want to say, hey, is this token still valid? Does it, um, you know, still reference a, a, a live credit card in the uh, database? So we can say, uh, you know, I'm going to use a transform secret engine. I'm going to validate uh, my token. And you can say, we get back something that says, hey, yes, it's actually, this token does exist and, and we have the data for it. Um, say we want to validate that uh, a particular credit card number already exists. So, you know, maybe we had a customer come in through a retail store. Um, you know, we captured their credit card sitting in a, a database. Then they come through mobile. And, you know, do we add another record for this uh, credit card when we saw it? Or do we just want to say, um, you know, hey, we've already seen, have we seen this credit card before? Um, so that might be a use case for this. So we're going to say, um, uh, we can validate that, uh, you know, this credit card actually already has a token. So we're going to say, uh, you know, we're going to transform it. We're going to say tokenize. Um, we'll throw in our, um, you know, our credit card number that we used before. And then we get back something that says, hey, you know what? This has already been tokenized. Uh, there's a value for it. Um, say we want to retrieve the actual credit card based off the token. Um, you know, this, um, uh, what would be a use case for this? So say maybe... Um, you know, you you have a bunch of customers and you're billing them on a recurring cycle, maybe once a month or something. Maybe, uh, you know, you're a telecom provider or something. Um, and, you know, you're doing batch uh, payment processing. So, uh, you know, every month you're going to want to go through all your customer records and you're going to want to bill them. Um, so we can say, um, you know, vault rate, we want to decode uh, this mobile payment um, and we're going to pass in that customer's token. And then we get back the, uh, the rock the raw credit card that we can actually go on pay, uh, payment process. Um, so that's the new feature. Uh, I'm going to jump back to the slide deck and then maybe I'll, I'll wrap up. So um, this sort of highlights, uh, you know, if you want to use traditional tokenization using FPE or you want to use, um, uh, you know, something a little bit more traditional in that, uh, you know, my, you know, maybe your company is already doing tokenization today and, uh, you know, you have vault and you want to sort of kick the tires on this. Uh, this opens up a whole, whole slew of new use cases, uh, for customers that require, you know, non-reversible, uh, uh, you know, ways of getting tokenizing their data. Um, I think, uh, I don't know. I wanted to give you a demo of this, but I don't know if I'm going to have time. So I think I'll just chat about this one and then uh, maybe we'll uh, jump over to questions. So we have another uh, feature, um, you know, in tech preview called key management secret engine. So the sort of high level uh, goal of this feature is that, you know, in all the major cloud providers, they'll typically have something called a, a KMS key management store. Uh, the idea here is, you know, say you're a, uh, you know, a bank or a highly regulated customer and you want to use the cloud, typically you're regulated on, uh, you know, sort of the encryption uh, that you can use and, you know, the keys that you can use and sort of who maintains the trust of those keys and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the use case is, you know, say I, I upload a bunch of data to Google Cloud, uh, does Google have access to it, right? Um, or, hey, does AWS have access to my data when it's sitting there? However, you know, if I use this KMS, I can upload my own keys, I can encrypt my own data, and then I can know that, hey, the cloud provider uh, doesn't necessarily have uh, access to that data. You know, if a support person wants to go rifle through a bunch of my uh, personal data, are they able to or not? That's where these sort of key, key management secret engine or KMS uh, come into play. However, say you're a large enterprise uh, company it, become, it can become like a management nightmare to go in and maintain, you know, hundreds of keys, manage the life cycle, who has access to what keys, what keys are allowed to do sort of what operations. So this new key management secret engine acts as sort of a remote control for a lot of these. Um, uh, well, the intention is to have it act as a remote control for a lot of these uh, cloud providers. Right now, we're only supporting Azure, but you're going to quickly see uh, support for the other cloud providers. So let me just maybe walk you through uh, what we're doing here. 
So you can enable a new uh, key management secret engine. You can create a key, then you establish a link with the, from Vault to the Azure uh, KMS, and then you can pr start provisioning uh, keys. You can, you know, uh, um, you know, define uh, the capabilities of that particular key. You know, whether it's backed by uh, HSM, and then you can go and do all sorts of. Uh, cryptographic function say hey i want to encrypt data with this key um you know locally and then i want to uh decrypt it on the uh, cloud provider or maybe i want to encrypt it on the cloud provider and then decrypt it locally this gives you a, a whole slew of uh capabilities around that um you know also key rotation hey I, I need to rotate my keys um vault can manage all that for you now um you know again this is tech preview uh you know don't roll this out into production yet but if you want to sort of kick the tires and uh, uh, see how it works. Um, for the tech preview, we're only supporting uh, Azure, but you're going to quickly see uh, the other cloud providers come on. So that sort of wraps up the major features that I want to talk about. But obviously, there's a, a whole slew of other functionality that went into 1.6. Um, you know, if you're using uh, seal migration, you know, you want to use, uh, you know, auto unseal, where you've added the ability to, you know, transition from basically any method of unsealing over to another uh, method. Um, uh, we've also added uh, install packages. So, you know, if you're running, uh, uh, you know, apt-get or, uh, you know, you're running RPM, you know, you can download packages now. We're supporting uh, Homebrew. So, if you know, if you're, you want to do brew install vault, uh, you can do that. Uh, this didn't happen uh, uh, with the 1.6 release, but it happened between 1.6, 1.5 and 1.6. So, I sort of wanted to call it out. You know, if you're using AWS Lambda uh, functions, and you want to pull secrets out of Vault, uh, we, we now have the capability to uh, do that. Uh, we have a custom extension. Same thing for, um, you know, GitHub uh, Actions. If, uh, you know, in your CI CD workflow, if you want to pull out a secret uh, from Vault, uh, we have a, an action as well as, uh, uh, you know, step-by-step -step instructions on how to do that. So uh, that should be uh, really cool. Another uh, feature that we've added is... Um, you know, we've updated the uh, database secret engines to support password policy. So a lot of uh, folks will say, hey, um, you know, I'm in a regulated environment and I need to be changing my database passwords on a, uh, you know, three-month cycle. You can actually go and uh, set up Vault to do that for you. However, I have a sp particular password policy of, you know, it has to be this many numbers, this many characters, special characters and stuff. So you can now define these policies where Vault will go and uh, do that. Um, We've added uh, Couch uh, DB support as well as, um, you know, added uh, Spring Spring support for the Transform Secret Engine. Uh, all of this can be basically all the links for all the stuff that I chatted about. Um, you know, all the learn guides. You you can check out the Vault 1.6 blog. Um, also, you know, the learn site. I really can't understate how much of a goldmine this is. If if you just want to get into Vault and play around with it, um, you know, a lot of the things that we've talked about are sort of advanced use cases today. But um, there's just a, a whole slew of content if, um, you know, you're just just trying to get on board and saying, like, okay, how do I actually store a secret and retrieve it? You know, uh, simple workflows like that, step-by-step -step guides, uh, just absolutely awesome. All the way up to all the advanced stuff that I've uh, showed you today, um, you know, all free. Uh, you can go use it. Cool. So... I think with that, I'm going to stop uh, my presentation and then I'm going to go through the uh, QA. So please uh, sort of bear with me as I uh, go through this in that um, uh, I'm going to basically be reading it on the fly. So uh, <laughs> um, there might be a little bit of lag as I'm going through this. Um, are you supporting uh, Arch Linux? Um, right now, um, we only have... Uh, um, you know, uh, you know, Deb packages, Deb and RPM packages, as well as uh, Brew. Um, but you can obviously download the binary. You know, if if I think if we see enough folks that are using like Arch Linux, uh, we can definitely uh, uh, look into that. But uh, right now, we're we're not uh, we don't support that. Uh, is the consistency of the raft uh, snapshot ensured? Uh, you know, when saving a large database. Um, in the example that I showed, I showed a uh, four node cluster, um, you know, and I actually ran the snapshot on a follower node. In that case, um, uh, I think if you want, can, uh, 
you know, I, I probably did something that wasn't a best practice and that you typically want to run it on the uh, leader node. So you'd run it on, you know, node one, uh, you capture the snapshot and um, consistency is ensured. So you will get a complete uh, snapshot. Um, uh, can we see the KMS demo like the others? Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm out of time for the, that demo. Um, but there actually, if you go to the Learn site, um, uh, there is a complete uh, demo that you can walk through. Um, uh, so just go to learn.hashicorp.com, go into the vault section. There's a what's new uh, section there, and you'll see something for the uh, key management secret engine. And it gives you step-by-step -step instructions uh, on, on how to set all that up. Um, So what's the benefit of, um, you know, using this KMF feature versus just doing it natively, uh, you know, with a cloud provider? I'd say it's more of just management sort of, um, you know, ease or less friction. You know, typically you aren't going to just have one key sitting in there, right? You're going to have a whole different uh, bunch of groups having a whole bunch of different keys. And it's become going to become a management nightmare or sort of a, uh, you know, a real mess to say, when was this thing last rotated? Who has access to it? Uh, what capabilities does it have? Um, you know, uh, what are the old keys? Uh, you can manage that, manage all that through Vault. Um, you know, through sort of your Vault workflow. I'd say you know that's sort of the benefit of it. Um, but uh, I, I think it would really depend on your use case. You know, if you have one key sitting in the KMS, then I don't know if this is going to be a major benefit to you because I, uh, you know, you could just manage it and manage it through the UI. You know, it doesn't even necessarily have to be one key. You know, if it was, uh, you know, five keys or something like that, that's still not probably a, uh, enough of a benefit to use this feature. But, um, you know, if you if you have a lot of management f sort of friction managing those keys, then obviously it's going to be, a, you know, it's going to save you time. Um, is the tokenizer only available in enterprise? Yes, um, that's an enterprise feature. Um, but, uh, you know, if you're interested in playing around with it, you can download the enterprise binary. And, uh, you know, it does expire after 30 minutes, but you can restart it and play with it again. However, if you want a, a month-long uh, trial license, you, if you just Google, you know, enterprise, Vault Enterprise uh, Trial, um, you'll come to a form where you uh, enter your email, and then you'll be emailed uh, a license key for 30 days where you can, you know, uh, play around with this. Um does Vault 1.6 integrate with the uh, Cloud HSM? Yeah, so um, if you want to do, um, so in one of the demos there, I did uh, integrated storage, and then I manually unsealed a particular Vault. Um, yeah, we integrate with all the cloud providers to do HSM you know, auto unseal. Uh, basically, you can upload your uh, keys into there, and then you don't need to manually uh, you know, unseal a Vault. Obviously, you know, this is a best practice in that, um, say it's uh, 2 a.m., uh, you're an ops engineer, and uh, one of your vault nodes goes down, uh, the auto scaler kicks in, you provision a new node, it joins the cluster, and then it stops uh, and says, hey, I need some manual input for you to enter this uh, auto unseal key. Um, you can use the Cloud HSM to, uh, you know, auto unseal that, so, you know, it doesn't require any manual intervention. Um, which is a real, you know, lifesaver. You can have a, you know, a highly available, you know, uh, cluster. That's all open source. You can play around with that. Um, I'd like to use, uh, I'd like to switch to S3 as a raft backend. Uh, I think this is around, uh, you know, upgrade, upgrading uh, the guide and, you know, sort of the, some of the instructions. Uh, uh, for this one, you know, I'll take this. I'll take this one off. Uh, this question offline, and I'll I'll chat with the education team about uh, getting that guide updated. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, is the tokenization uh, deterministic? Will the same input uh, result in the same token? Uh, you know, uh, being output. I uh, know you're going to get different tokens. So um, uh, if you um, you know, um, uh, you know, run through run through multiple credit cards using the tokenization feature. You're going to get uh, different tokens. Same thing with FPE. If you use the same uh, credit card, you're going to get uh, different tokens. 
or I guess uh, you know, uh, to, uh, you know, transform data is probably the better way of saying it uh, for FBE. Um, how do I get started with Vault? Uh, again, uh, you know, if you're just learning Vault or want to play around with it, check out learn.hashicorp.com. Or if you just go to vaultproject.io, there's a, a learn uh, section right in the header there. That'll take you over to the learn site. Um, I think there's over, I think there's, uh, you know, at least several hundred guides on there, all the way from, you know, 101 type stuff of what is Vault? How do I get it started? How do I get a developer mode uh, going? You know, adding my first secret all the way up to advanced uh, use cases like, hey, I'm using Kubernetes. I want to inject uh, secrets, um, uh, you know, all the way to the, the stuff that we talked about today using, you know, Transform or KMS or, um, you know, integrated storage. Um, usually I have my uh, cluster on a standalone instance. Um, Um, I think the question here is more of, hey, I'm running, uh, you know, integrated storage on-prem and I want to use the auto join feature. How can I do that? Right now, we're we're only supporting Go Discover, which supports, you know, all the cloud providers. So we really need that external piece that says, that's providing that metadata saying, hey, here's where my uh, vault nodes are. If you wanted to do that on-prem, uh, how folks are doing that today is using uh, console. Um, you know, if you uh, just Google, um, you know, uh, what would you Google there? You know, Vault Integrated Storage Console, you'll come up with a design pattern that'll I'll show you that if you want to do it on-prem. If you want to do it, you know, in the cloud, you can just use this auto-join functionality, though. Um, sorry, I'm just uh, just reading the questions here. Uh, so there's a little bit of uh, lag as I'm reading it and answering it. Um, there's a question, a question here of, uh, hey, what is Tech Preview? Uh, I guess I never really explained that. So Tech Preview is, um, you can sort of think of it like a beta or an alpha. You know, we've added this new feature into uh, uh, Vault. It's not production ready. Um, so don't go and deploy it into production. But it's it's... The tech preview is to give you um, basically be able to kick the tires or play around with it, get enough uh, sort of hands-on knowledge, and you know be able to provide feedback to us to say, um, you know, hey, I'm using this uh, similar functionality today, but you know, if you had this one feature or it worked this particular way, um, that'd be really cool. So, the tech preview is basically uh, to give us uh, the ability to gather feedback, you know, refine the feature. Um, sort of sand off any of the rough spots before it, uh, you know, goes into uh, a GA product. So that's uh, what Tech Preview is. Um, yeah. Uh, there's one here about, um, hey, is there any plans to, um, you know, update the GitHub Ref storage Terraform examples uh, with AutoJoin? Um, it seems they haven't been updated for Vault 1.6. Um, you know, I, I don't know the status of that one, so I'll check offline with the team that's uh, looking after that, and we'll try to get it updated for 1.6. Um, chances are they probably already have it in their pipeline, but uh, maybe it, it didn't make it in yet. Um, so I th there's a question here about um, the uh, using transform with FPE, format preserving encryption. And it's, hey, if I, I um, you know, encrypt a credit card number, am I always going to get the same, uh, you know, encoded credit card number? Uh, you know, is there a one-to-one -one mapping? Uh, no. So if uh, you generate, uh, you know, you, you use FPE to, um, you know, run that transformation across a credit card number, you're always going to get uh, different data out. So it's, um, it's not a one-to-one -one mapping there. Which is probably a good thing, you know, um, uh, well, it is a good thing in that, you know, you, you can't uh, use a whole bunch of encoded values to, uh, you know, reverse uh, the algorithm there. Um, has there been any, any updates or changes to the Vault API? Um, I, I'd say there has been a, a bunch, but I, I, you know, obviously to support this new functionality, you know, a bunch of new endpoints were added. But uh, if you're looking for sort of any breaking changes, if you go to the Vault website and uh, there's upgrade pages, um, you know, you can go and look for 1.6 and I'll give you a list of, uh, you know, any of the breaking changes. I don't think there was anything 
you know, off the top of my head that I remember, uh, you know, any API breaking changes or stuff like that uh, to the regular API. But obviously, we've extended the API with this uh, new functionality. Um, there's a feature here about the new automated snapshot supporting, um, you know, third-party S3 providers that have, you know, API compatibility with uh, the S3. Um, personally, I haven't tested it, but, you know, if it's compatible with the S3 a API, I'd imagine it would just work, but, uh, you know, you'd need to test it. I, th I think we're only going to support, you know, obviously AWS uh, S3, but, uh, um, you know, if I imagine if you're using... Um, you know, OpenStack or OpenShift or something like that, and it's, you know, has a S3 compatible API, you can probably get it to work, but, you know, I haven't tested it. Um, yeah, there's something about, hey, can we share the slides? Yeah, you'll get to all the slides and a recording of this uh, presentation after uh, we're done here. I think, uh, I think it's about, a you know, it might be a delayed by a few days, but you'll definitely get to all the material here. Um, also, these recordings are typically up on YouTube. You know, if you're watching it, uh, you know, in the future on YouTube, hi. <laughs> um, um, sorry, I'm just going through the questions here. I think we've answered a lot of these. Um, there's a question here about, hey, I'm using Kubernetes. Does this new um, uh, integrated storage auto-join feature work uh, there? Um, I don't actually know the answer to that, but uh, I can, I'll check with the team there. I know, uh, uh, obviously, they're keeping on top of all the all the features and functionality, but uh, it, it might not be in the latest Helm chart, but I imagine it's uh, on the roadmap uh, because... Internally, this has been a, a very requested feature. Um, you know, uh, anyone who's using a cloud provider, uh, you know, obviously wants to automate a lot of stuff. And so uh, we've heard this from countless folks. So I, I imagine this will 100% be added into the Helm chart if it's uh, not already there. But I imagine it's not there since you asked the question. Um, so there's a question here about, you know, when I did that integrated... Um, uh, storage feature. So I think this will be the last question just because we're bumping up on time. But um, there's a question here about, um, you know, when we created that integrated storage cluster, I had three nodes and then I created that fourth node. Uh, when I go and, um, you know, unseal that vault, what happens? So behind the scenes, um, you know, those vault nodes are, are using something called the raft protocol and they, those nodes join into, you know, a highly available cluster. And they're constantly cluster, they're constantly syncing cluster state, as well as cluster data, uh, you know, secret data between the nodes. So if a node goes offline, uh, there will be a new uh, election, and uh, you know there will be a new uh, leader within that cluster. So uh, this gives you highly available storage and a highly available cluster just uh, out out of the box using this feature, which is uh, super cool. Um, I think with that, we're at time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, kick it back to uh, Laura and she'll uh, close this out. Thanks very much. Thank you, Justin. And thank you everyone for participating today. Thanks for all the great questions and answers. Um, as Justin mentioned, we'll be sharing out this presentation and the recording later this week. Um, and if you're interested in checking out other events, check out hashicorp.com events and we hope to see you soon. Thank you all.